coaching, workshops, videos, and online webinars and courses. For the past two years, she has grown this passion to include communication presentations to fellow canine professionals, all of you lovely people here, in a yearly workshop, Trainers United Summit. And she's gonna be speaking on Lost in Translation. This is such a critical topic, such a critical topic, and I'm glad it's right at the front end of things here. When we're, a lot of us get in this business because, there's more than a couple dog trainers that don't really like people. Is that fair to say? <laughs> I didn't know how to put that out there in a way that wasn't offensive, but I feel like that's true. And the problem is that becomes the bottleneck is when we can't communicate and successfully transfer the skill sets to our clients, like what good is everything, right? All the work that we've done, these people have to go home and live with them and inspiring and motivating our clients is such a critical thing in communication is everything. If your communication is quality, the training is going to be quality as well, assuming you don't suck as a trainer. So if you've got both of those pieces together, you're going to win. And I'm so excited that Tracy's going to be talking to us about this today. So everybody, please welcome Miss Tracy. <laughs> Consider the number one fear of the average person. I found that amazing. Number two was death. <laughs> death is number two? This means to the average person, if you have to be in a funeral, you would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. <laughs> that's Jerry Seinfeld, and that's a very popular quote in the public speaking realm. It is true, public speaking is considered the number one fear for most people. To stand up here in front of a group of people is terrifying. 
Now, why should you care as a dog trainer? Some of you might be sitting there going, well, I never want to stand up there, Tracy, and I'm perfectly fine with that, and that's perfectly okay. But this, what we're gonna talk about today actually involves all, all aspects of communication, from conversational communication, to speaking to a small group of people, to standing up and doing keynotes or presentations. So why should you care as a dog trainer? This is a quote from Donald Miller from StoryBrand. Anyone here follow Donald Miller from StoryBrand? Yeah, he's pretty awesome. Now he's talking about marketing when he has this quote that the person that communicates clearly wins. But I will say to you that marketing is simply a manipulation of communication. It really is. So if you get good at communication, you will master marketing and you will skyrocket your business. You can literally launch a business on communication alone if you start to really delve into this a little bit, okay? So I have here, think about some of your favorite dog trainers out there. This obviously isn't all of them. This is a few of them. Oh wait, we missed one. There. Uh, there I am. Okay, I might not be your favorite dog trainer out there, but there, there's a lot of dog trainers out there. And what would you say these guys all have in common? They're really good looking people, right, exactly. So what do us normal looking people have to do? No, they are all really good. I would say some of them are up there with the great communicators. That's what's making the difference. I would say because all of you guys are sitting in this room here today, you are people that come to conferences, you are people that work constantly on honing your skills as dog trainers, I would say there's a good portion, if not most of you in here, don't necessarily need to up your dog training skills game if you're struggling at all building your business. I would say you probably need to up your communication game, right? And it's the thing you probably don't want to do, right? So even if you don't agree with somebody's methods or their message, if they're beating you in the marketplace, it's not because of their dog training skills. It's because they're communicators. Ooh, did you feel the room change? <laughs> did you feel it? You could feel it, it was visceral. Everybody felt it, oh, right? I'm not gonna play her, sorry. She, she, she says words, uh, same with this guy. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna play. I'm not gonna play it. Um, and again, it doesn't matter that. Well, we could play him a little bit. No, no, no. Come on. But here's the bottom line. Even if you do not agree with their methods, even if you are sitting at home going, "Oh my God, I can't believe the things these people are saying," they are successful because they say it better than you. Yeah. Even if the message is wrong. They're saying it better to, than you. So again, we're gonna go back to this guy here. Why should you care? If your competitor has an inferior product or service, but they are better at communicating it, they will beat you in the market every single time. And I hear it, I sit in the tables and I sit in the rooms with dog trainers and I hear you talking about the other side, the other people, the, what's going on there. And you're like, why do people even listen? Because they're good at communicating. That's it. So you don't need to up your game as dog trainers. You're all phenomenal dog trainers. You need to up how you talk, how you say it. So a little bit about me, in case you didn't know. My name's Tracy. I'm a mom. I'm a dog trainer. I'm a business owner. Oh, I went too fast. But blah, 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 other stuff. I'm also a very passionate public speaker. I love this. I actually sadly love this more than I love training dogs. <laughs> if you could put me on a stage every day, it's hard to get me off stages. I'm just like, yay, I'll go back on stage. I love speaking. I love doing this. Uh, and what I've found is because of that skill and because of doing this, uh, it has skyrocketed my business in ways I actually had to stop speaking. <laughs> I was literally like, I can't do that presentation because I don't have the time to take the clientele that's going to come after that presentation. That's a hard thing to deal with, isn't it? Wouldn't you hate that? So I joined Toastmasters in 2012 and uh, started competing in 2013. I won my first competition in 2014 in a humorous speech competition, which was as far as I could go in that division. 
And uh, from there, I've just been taking uh, comedic seminars. I've been taking public speaking seminars. I've spoken on Mo' Monday stages. I travel to different places. I absolutely love this. This doesn't have to be your journey. You don't have to go that crazy. Has anyone here ever tried a Toastmasters meeting? Yes, good. Has anyone heard of Toastmasters? Yes. Is there a reason why nobody wants to go to Toastmasters? It's probably because you heard it's a little weird, right? It's a, it's a little weird. The Toastmasters meetings are a little bit odd. Have you been? Yes. They're a little weird. Um, but they are weird in the way that you guys are weird. <laughs> right? I'm sure if anyone else came into like this and saw you guys all talking, they'd probably be like, oh, dog trainers. <laughs> so, we're, Toastmasters is weird in the same sort of way. It's just a bunch of people really passionate about public speaking and leadership skills. But I, what I want to do today for you guys is I'm going to take you very quickly through what the Toastmasters, if you were to join Toastmasters, now they've changed it a little bit, but this is the old school, um, what they call their competent communicator manual. So I'm going to fast track you through that to give you the, the actual steps and what it takes for what they would consider you to be competent in communication skills, which is kind of cool. So there's 10 speeches in that Toastmasters manual. Uh, and they're all, they all build skills upon one another. So the first speech in that thing is just called an icebreaker. And essentially all it is, is it's just to get your feet wet. You just have to, you just, Nike said it best, right? You just have to do it. There's no good way for you to get over your fear of public speaking than to just do it. Unfortunately, it starts small, get up in front of a small group, just do it. But that's the best way to start. And when we have new people come into a Toastmasters meeting, we make them do their icebreaker, we're really, really kind, right? The evaluation of an icebreaker speech is like, you look really pretty, you know, <laughs> even though I think you soiled yourself behind a lectern. <laughs> Your dress covered it well. Like, we are really good at making sure that people understand that yes it's hard this is scary this is your number one fear and you conquered it good for you and that's all that's about all right the next speech is called organize your speech this is going to actually take you back to grade school and I'm going to encourage everybody here to really think about this because I see it all the time in posts I see it all the time in people's videos we are missing the fundamentals of public speaking there should be an introduction, a body, and a conclusion to all your communication. You shouldn't just get online and just be like, I'm just going to ramble on about things. Because if you don't have this kind of order, you lose your audience. Right? You lose your audience, you lose your sales, you lose your clients, you lose everything. So I, I put this in there. I want you to kind of think about this. There's obviously more to this. This is just going to be an overlay. But if you start off and think, I'm going to do a post today, I'm going to do a video today, Take the time to do an intro, think about some points you want to talk about, and then your conclusion. And your conclusion should always wrap up what you talked about. It should kind of swing back around from your introduction, put a nice little bow, so that your audience follows a journey. Okay, that's important. To the point. Ooh, this is about getting to the point. I think this is one of the, this and the number four is probably one of the hardest things that dog trainers and people in general struggle with. Um, the phrase, to make a long story short, needs to be at the start of your story, right? You can't say the phrase, well, to make a long story short, if you've already had three costume changes, a plot twist, there's been an intermission, you know, you really need to make everything short and get to the point. Your point should have a general purpose as well as a specific purpose. So your general purpose to your talk should have something. Is your purpose to educate? Then you need to make sure that purpose is there. Is your purpose <coughs> to entertain? Is your purpose to, you know, inspire? What is your purpose? And then your specific purpose should be also defined. So if my purpose in this was to, you know, if I'm talking to clients, my purpose is to educate my specific person purpose may be to get them to switch training tools that kind of thing but you need to have that in mind when you when you speak okay and I have down here a little quote from Celeste Headley she has uh, it's 10 ways for a better co uh, conversation it's a TED talk I would highly recommend looking it up uh, but she always says the phrase stay out of the weeds 
And I see that a lot of times in lots of people's videos and lots of their conversations and talks. Stay out of the weeds. You, you guys get your, you lose your audience with all the extra information that we throw in there. They don't need to know it all. Stay out of the weeds, okay? Now, is there exceptions to this rule? Yes, there is. There is exceptions to every rule. Yes, if you are exceptional. <laughs> For example, I don't think she's in here anymore, but if you're Heather Beck and your story starts off with, I was walking a camel <laughs> through TST, then yeah, you can elaborate a little bit on that story, right? Because it's pretty exceptional. If I start a story of, so I bought a bus, to ship dogs, I might be able to elaborate on this. And I'm gonna say he is in here. I'm also gonna say there's another exception to this rule. And I say this with love because he can kill me. <laughs> if you are Nelson Hodges, <laughs> there are exceptions to this rule. I say this out of love, Nelson. I was really hoping you weren't gonna be here. Um, how many people here have been to a Nelson workshop? Yes, yes. I've been to two of his three days and one of his nine days. They are phenomenal. But I will say this, if you ask Nelson a question, usually it involves something like, okay, Nelson, I hear what you're saying. You were able to dismantle that whole situation with your bare hands, no tools, no crates, no nothing. But what do we mere mortals do? And Nelson will go, oh, and he'll start to tell you something, and then 45 minutes later, <laughs> you are like, okay? And he'll say, I don't know, did I answer that question? And you're like, I don't even know what the question was, but I just know that I feel smarter just being in the room with you, Nelson, and that's all that really matters. That's, that's, that's been my experience with Nelson. Again, I love you. I love you. Said with love, because um, he's gonna kill me. So if you are like James Bond, secret agent, ninja, dog trainer guy, there are exceptions to this rule. People will not care because your stories are phenomenal and you just don't even know. You're just like, okay, fine. But if you're average people like myself, you have to stick to the point, right? You have to get to the answers. You have to stick to the point. Otherwise, you'll lose your audience. Number four, how to say it. This is the words you choose. I love this slide. I love this slide. Um, <laughs> this is about the language that you use and the words that you use. And it's incredibly important that you think about this very, very clearly because what we say and how we say it matters. Now, all professionals tend to struggle with this because we struggle with this idea of we want to sound like we know what we're talking about. So we want to use industry lingo and that sort of thing so that our audience knows that we're smart. Uh, but the problem with that is you need to know your audience. You don't want to talk over their heads. You don't want to use language that they don't understand. If you're a dental hygienist and you're sitting in a room full of other dental hygienists, then you talk in those teeth-like terms. But if you're sitting there talking to your average person, they won't know what you're talking about when you're talking about all those different teeth. Same with us. And I would say for us, for me personally, I have found that because in our industry, in the dog training industry in particular, uh, a lot of our clients think they understand the lingo, right? They will come to you and they'll say words that they think they want to hear like dominance, like submission, those kind of words, but they don't actually understand the terms. And what happens when that, when that goes on is that people, if you say the word dominance to a dog, the average person automatically will go, well, that means that the dog was genetically born that way and I can't change it. And it leaves them feeling hopeless, right? It makes them shut down from the work because they'll go, well, obviously I can't fix it. And I know a lot of dog trainers have changed this lingo. And you'll hear now people say words like your dog is acting bratty or snotty or sassy. whatever, sassy, whatever language you change. But what happens there is then you get the people go, well, I don't want my dog being bratty. And that inspires them to actually do the work. 
So the words you choose and who you're talking to really do matter. Um, so use language that serves the purpose, right, to inspire, right? That's really what we're trying to do. We, want, we need to inspire and encourage our dog owners to do the work, right? So if you're using language that is going to shut them down, then you're not going to get the results that you need, okay? So words matter. Choose your words wisely. I'm going to tell a story, a Walmart story. Because all good stories start off in Walmart. Uh, I was in Walmart this summer. I had to get a bathing suit for my son, not for me, for my son. <laughs> and we were, you know, we were picking out some bathing suits. We were heading off to where they get changed. And I being the responsible parent that I am, and I make sure because there's the girl there putting the clothes back <coughs> on the line, the ones that people didn't want. And I wanted her to know that I'm a responsible parent, you know, because that's important. And I turned to my son and I said, just so you know, Connor, when you're trying on bathing suits, keep your underwear on, right? Number one rule. So I'm basically saying to her, just so you know, I'm a responsible parent. I'm not one of these people that's going to let my kids just be like running around all butt naked in Walmart. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> so I sit down. Now, here's what the woman turned to me and said. And this is why I'm saying words matter. She turned to me and she said, make sure if he doesn't want those clothes that he puts them on this rack. Make sure. Which led me to say, what happens if he doesn't? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I literally now was like, challenge accepted. <laughs> now I want to know what will happen Will the Walmart security guards come out and arrest us if we don't put a really turn me into this? And I'm not like that. I'm like, I'm, I'm the person that would have cleaned the rest of the clothes out of the thing for her if she had it just said it nicely. But those words matter. All she had to say was, hey, just so you know, the clothes go here. That would have been fine. But no, she said, make sure. So I was all like, no, I want to take all the clothes off and put them somewhere else. And it really changed how I felt about that moment. So I need you guys to kind of think about that when you're talking to people, remembering that we want to inspire them. So the words that you use matter, okay? Your body speaks. This is getting good. This is number five. This is getting good at using body language and facial expression. So this is mostly important for you guys that are finally delving into video and getting videos done, that sort of thing. This is actually taking a good hard look at how much you're moving or how much you're not moving and how you're moving. So you need to avoid awkward or repetitive things. Now we're always working on this. I'm sure if I were to replay this video, I'm gonna notice that I keep doing this movement on the stage because it's annoying. But I can't help myself, it's what I do, it's something that I'm working on. You need to move naturally, okay? That's important. Smile. Oh my goodness, the amount of people that I've watched on videos that have this like, you look like you're dying. I'm like, <laughs> like, oh my god, I gotta do this video, and you're trying to be professional. Just for the love of God, have fun. Smile, it's not that bad. So body language should enhance your talk. It shouldn't take away from your talk. So my tip here for anybody is that uh, I would highly recommend if you're going to start doing videos or you're going to start doing talks, to video yourself and then watch it without sound. That's where you'll see it. You'll see the weird twitchy thing that you <laughs> were doing and the vibrating and the weird hand thing. And what I'll do sometimes is I'll actually, if I'm video editing, I'll turn the sound off and then I'll run the video in fast and backwards and forwards and I'll see like my hand doing this and I'm like, what am I doing there? Am I, am I waving? Is there a bug? What's going on? Right? So it's a good little tip if you want to start to see kind of what weird sort of things you've been doing on video. <laughs> Number six is vocal variety. That's from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. We all know that movie, right? I'm not the only one that likes Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Remember that movie? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. All right, so this is learning to use different types of things. Pitch, tone, pace, volume. Volume's a good one for your one-on-one -on -one assessments. This is a little tip that I have. If you don't think that people are paying attention to you, turn your volume down on how you speak to them. 
just start speaking a little bit more quietly. And what you'll see is people actually will lean in. <laughs> And they'll focus a little bit more. I use volume a lot in my in, in a lot of my conversations and my communications. Uh, my kids also know if I start getting very very quiet, stuff's going down. <laughs> Mom's being quiet, right? Volume's a good one. Pause <laughs> for dramatic effect. Um, <laughs> pausing. Now, I've taken a lot of comedic workshops and that sort of thing for my public speaking, so pausing for comedic timing is really, really critical, but pausing in general is incredibly important and probably the thing that most people don't use enough. Pausing helps make points, right? If you're trying to make a point, you pause, you let it sink in, it also allows your audience to catch up to you. So if you're at a part, if you're seeing a difficult conversation with somebody and you're at a part where you need them to kind of catch up to you, pausing is incredibly important. Videos is where I see most people just kind of ramble on and on and on and on. And it's because you're talking to a camera and you don't see people's faces. So if you can try to remember that you're talking to an individual and figure out where they need to pause, where you need to pause, what points need to be made, it's really critical for them to understand um, and for, for you to get the, the timing of your talk down. Pausing is probably one of the most underused tools that you can use. Uh, and I have your vocal variety it should also enhance and not distract from your message. Pressing buttons, and nothing, there we go. Research, so number seven is called research your topic. Now, I again, I'm gonna point out that you guys are all experts in your field, and I know that because you're here, right? If you weren't at a conference, constantly working on development, then you, you may need to work on this, but I know that you guys know your stuff, right? So, for research here, I said, you know, you need to be prepared. Like, not like me that just moved and couldn't find my boxes of things to bring. Um, you need to be prepared. So, knowing your audience is a big one, okay? For any of you out there that are out there trying to make changes, which we, I know we all are, but I know a couple of you have gone out and tried to talk to rescues or tried to talk to shelter systems about utilizing tools and that sort of thing. Knowing your audience is really critical. You need to know them in a way that um, is going to still help you with your cause, to inspire, to make change. We're fighting a good fight out there, and it's not an easy fight. So being prepared, knowing your audience, doing your research, know your stage or your room, right? If, if you get invited to a shelter, know what you're gonna be up against. Are you actually speaking in the room where the dogs are gonna be barking? <laughs> You know, and no one's gonna hear you. So getting that sort of stuff done first. I put here, don't improvise unless you're good at it. Okay, improvisation is a skill. Um, and anybody that's joined or that's ever been to a Toastmasters meeting, we actually practice that every single meeting. There's a part of the Toastmasters meeting called table topics, where you literally get a topic to speak about for one to two minutes. Um, and you have to stand up right there and then, it has to have an introduction, a body and a close, and you have to, it may, has to make sense, you get time one to two minutes. So I've had a lot of practice doing improv stuff, and it's still nerve wracking. So for your videos, for going to do stuff, be prepared, do your research, don't improvise. And then I put here, you gotta get good at improvising, right? And we have to get good at improvising because of our industry, right? We're, we're dealing with dogs and, and things that don't necessarily go our way. So you need to, it is something that you need to work on and improve, but if you don't have to improv, don't, okay? Because you will come across as someone that doesn't know what you're talking about if you're not good. And be prepared for hecklers, <laughs> you ladies. Sure. <laughs> be prepared for hecklers, but I should also add here, be prepared for uh, dogs. Right? Dogs that are not going to do the things that you want them to do. And you need to be prepared for your emotional response to what happens when the dogs don't do what you want them to do. So for me in comedy stuff, I have to be prepared for if a joke falls flat and the audience stares at me, 
don't like what you're all doing now. Uh, but if a joke falls flat, and well, I'm sure I have to be prepared for that emotionally. How am I going to recover from that? You guys have to be prepared for, like, you bring your demo dog, and your demo dog sucks today. <laughs> Not that that's ever happened. And you're like, oh, how do, I, like, how do I recover from that, right? You need to have those responses in the back of your head before you go out. And I researched that as well. Buttons that work. There we go. Visual aids. So this is more for your presentations, keynotes, or classes. This is literally just getting good at visual aids. So um, these guys have been fantastic. I didn't have the right cord for my stuff, and this is now being played on someone else's computer with their stuff. So having awesome AV guys <laughs> that help you is fantastic, but uh, you need to get good at having backup plans and uh, knowing your stuff using PowerPoint or Keynote, being good at that. Uh, whiteboards, flip charts, pictures, videos, and then those darn demo dogs. Those darn demo dogs that just don't do what they're supposed to do. So you need to get good at what happens. And I've actually seen a lot of people do posts of, of um, you know, talking about their demo dogs that people were um, put off because their demo dogs looked sad or put off because their demo dog didn't do that. You need to be prepared for that. You need to be prepared for what happens if your dogs don't work the way they're supposed to work, right? Because they're dogs, and sometimes they don't work. <laughs> Neither does my remote. I'm obviously hitting the wrong button. There we go. All right, so number nine, we're getting into the heart of the Toastmasters manual, and as I say, all these speeches, they all, what you learn on each one, you will take to the next one, and everything builds upon it. So number nine speech is called Persuade, and it's influence your audience to adopt your viewpoint, which is essentially sales, right? As much as we don't want to admit it, I don't know about you, but I'm not really great at, I, I don't like sales, I don't like the ick of sales. Um, I tend to walk around sales and not actually sell anything. So uh, it, there's an art to persuasion. There's absolutely an art. You have to be passionate, you have to know your audience. Again, notice how that keeps coming up, know your audience. You have to appeal to morals, ethics, or logic when we're talking about persuasion, okay? And I put down here at the bottom here, when you get good at this stuff, if you get good at communication, sales come whether you want them or not. And this is what I was saying before, I got asked just to do a little conversation, a little talk at a friend's, kennel and she was like can you come out and do a talk and I love to talk so I was like yes and I showed up there I did this whole presentation I was so proud of it it had video it had all this stuff I was like yay and it was called it's not about your dog a better understanding to your dog's behavior thought that was clever I had all this stuff I talked and at the end of it I had pretty much the whole room go how do we sign up for this like how do we how do we how do we hire you and I was like I don't know. I um, I don't I don't have anything to give you. I don't I don't know. And so my friend who was writing the kennel was like, "We'll do this again next month, and we'll do another one." I was like, "Okay. I guess I have to come up with something to give to people or sell to people." And the same thing happened. I had so many people coming up to me and, "Can we hire you? Can we hire you? Can we hire you?" And I was like. No. Now, a little fun fact about Tracy that you need to know, and some of you will go, this isn't true, but you'll see it now. At the, you'll see it now in the conference. Now you're going to all look for it. You'll see it in the conference. I am an introvert. I, I actually should like start off with, hello, my name is Tracy, and I'm an introvert. Uh, I am a, I'm an introvert. I love public speaking, because when I'm up here, you're all over there. And you can stay over there, and I'll stay over here. But at the end of this presentation, if I could, I would like smoke bomb and then like <laughs> get out the back door, and then you won't see me for the rest of the conference, right? That's that's how I am. So after I spoke at this thing twice, and I had all these people coming up to me, I literally turned to my friend and was like, "Never ask me to speak again because this is awful." And she's like, "But everyone." You and I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> it was terrible. But 
in retrospect, if I had been on my game, I could have made a ton of money. And I could have kept making money if I had have had a product or a service that I could actually give them. So when you get good at this, sales happen whether you like it or not. And it's almost a floodgate of sales. And I mean that. That's why I say to you guys, this is why I'm so passionate about this. You guys are all kick-ass trainers that can be like, think about the trainer that you go, oh my God, so-and-so is here right? That can be you. That can be you. The difference is the communication. It's not the training, right? Unless you're Nelson. <laughs> can't be Nelson. That's all. Sorry, Nelson. <laughs> Nelson's like, Tracy's not ever coming back to any of my courses ever again. <laughs> okay, there's a type of speech. It's coming. Just wait. There, it, it will be there. Oh, there it is. So the number 10 speech in this series is to inspire, to motivate an audience to improve personally, emotionally, and professionally. And this should be the cornerstone of all of your work. This is what I strive to do in my daily stuff. You want to inspire people. This isn't just about training dogs. You're not training dogs at all. Your job in this industry is to inspire people to make changes. And when you inspire people to make those changes, you inspire them to change their lives and they improve emotionally and professionally and better. They just, everything gets better. This is what it should be about. And I know because I'm an introvert, I know because I love dogs and all of those other things, you want to focus on the dogs. You want, I, I'm, I'm so happy all you people showed up because I thought everyone else is going to go to like the other talks that are about, <laughs> about dogs. No one's going to come to the talk about talking. But this is where you can make the most improvement. This is where you can make the better change because you're all great at dog training. I haven't seen all of your work, but I know that you are because you're here, right? I know that you are. And sure, we can always learn more and we should stay up to date with our skills and that sort of thing. But if we don't have this, if we don't have the ability to communicate it, it's lost in translation. See what I did there? Oh my gosh, I came all the way back around. There's a nice little bow. So those are the 10 speeches. I'm gonna say this again because I think this line is very important. If your competitor has an inferior product or service, uh, they are better at communicating, they will beat you. They will beat you in the marketplace every single time. So unless you're just training dogs for fun, unless you're doing it as a hobby, then none of this matters. But if you want to make a difference in dogs' lives, if you want to make a difference in people's lives, it's not all about that dog training. It's got to be about the communication. So what can you do besides the notes that you took today? Because this is just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, that's me. Um, that's my, that's my award-winning speech. Uh, you can join a Toastmasters club. You can study the greats, right? You can find a mentor, right? You can find a communication, you can hire a speech coach. These are all things you can do. I mean, I encourage people to try Toastmasters meeting. I will say this, if you do look around and find, Toastmasters is international, you can find them everywhere. Um, if you do find a club and you walk in and it's really weird, I encourage you to try to find another one. Uh, because they are a little bit individual and they, they're different. I know, now I just moved, so I don't know where a club is where I live now, but I know when I was in Ottawa, I was in the Ottawa Valley Club. It was a little bit more eclectic. I liked it because it was entrepreneurs that were in there, so it was more geared to that. Ottawa also just started a young professionals club, so it was geared more to young people that were professionals. So you can find a club that will sort of hone into what it is that you're looking for if that's the route that you want to take. But just studying the grades, finding a good mentor, or hiring an actual speech coach. And oh, look at that. Oh, I'm Tracy, and I can also do public speech coaching for dog trainers. Oh my gosh, you see what I did there? I just ran it all the way back around. I do have a website, it's called My Life is a Humorous Speech. Uh, most of it on there is my humorous talk, but um, I have in the past two years been speaking at Trainers United Summit 
and we have been talking about helping people out. If you want some help, you can certainly reach out to me uh, and I can watch your videos for you, give you some assistance. Hiring a speech coach is probably, it's one of those business things, it's a business thing that you should do, okay? Does anybody have any questions? I don't know how long, I, I went over, oh my gosh. No I didn't, no I didn't, I didn't go over. Woo! <laughs> Have any I'll, questions? I'll come around with the mic for you guys so everybody can hear. Anyone want to stand up here? Uh, thank you. Just we hold it or you hold it? We just a boring question. Do we get these slides? Is there a way to get the slides? Sure. Yeah. Can we email you or have them? Uh, that's a good question. All my stuff's in boxes. <laughs> so, so I will arrange for you guys to get the slides, absolutely. Uh, maybe we'll just I can get your email address and I can email okay. anybody that wants to. Somebody will do it. Cindy. Cindy will do it. <laughs> She'll take care of it. Thank you so much. So my question is when your demo doc does fall flat and it's just an atrocity, how do you recover? Well, you're going to need to think about that ahead of time. I always have the old, I, we're all individuals, right? I go with humor, right? You got to stick with your strengths. So I'm a humorous speaker. Most people that come to me would expect that I'm going to be humorous. I usually make jokes of it. Uh, I like to just be, I point out the obvious, they're dogs, they're not robots, right? And then I usually use that to bridge that to, this is, this is what you go through. I'm just like you, the owner. Sometimes my dog doesn't work out, here's how I do with it. I know that it's frustrating, I know that it's this. So I use that whole, I'll take that opportunity to blend in, that I can relate to them, that we're all human, that all of our dogs, I think some of the most important posts that I've ever done is my outtakes of my videos. They're the most popular videos. If you go back and, and see your video, if you do this kind of thing, if I go back to my videos, the most popular videos I have are the ones where I've tripped over something, where the dogs have messed up. I've got one where my kids caught me like doing poop pickup and I'm like wiping it off my shoe. You know, I got so many likes for that and it's because that's what makes you relatable. So I always take those opportunities to be like, hey, it's a dog and let's work through it. And I find if you're just genuine with it, people really relate to it and it makes you that much more um, accessible. You know, you're not this like, I'm a person that knows everything. That's how I do it. But you have to find your own vibe, essentially. I know not anybody can do the, um, the comedy stuff. Hi Tara. Hi. So my biggest problem, I've always kind of considered myself a fairly okay communicator, but my problem is I'm an over explainer. Yeah. I go into things, like you said, stay out of the weeds. Like I explain, 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 but the reason I do that is because I get like this glazed over look from my clients and I really can't tell if they're taking in anything I'm saying. And I'll yeah. go, do you know what I'm saying? Do you, does, that under, does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? And I'll just go, uh-huh. So like, I don't know, how do you tell if people are taking the message that you're sending? So that comes into a lot of the know your audience part. And I don't know, were you at conference last year for Karen's mm -hmm. DISC stuff? Uh, we learned a lot of the DISC personality sort of thing, and that's really amplified my knowing of the audience. A lot of it will be the pausing. A lot of it will be making sure <laughs> making sure that you're not just saying the same things over again. So going through and going, what is your general purpose? What is your specific purpose? And then waiting. But most times, if you've got the glazed over look from people, it's just that they won't get it till they go home, right? So I usually just go, I'm gonna leave that with you. Let me know if, it, if there's anything else that you don't understand. Um, because you will just overwhelm them, right? They'll get, um, they'll, they'll have some of it, you just keep talking, and then the, all that stuff gets buried. So know what your point is, say it, pause. I like that you're asking them, is this, are you understanding this? And if they're going, yeah, I think so, but I'm just gonna leave that with you, and then come back to it. And, you know, because I'm assuming they're, they're, they're this is personal, this isn't 
These are people sitting in front of you. Yeah. They're there for a lesson and or a lot the. Of times it's an energy thing or a body language thing. Those things can be very vague to people who don't understand yeah. it. And so I'll ask them if it makes sense and they go, Yeah, I think so and then I kind of do the same thing. I'll say, just be mindful of that. You know, yeah. when you're going through this week with your dog, just be mindful of it and then we'll talk about it next time and see if you saw anything. Yeah, I'm an over explainer too. I spend too much time my assessments can run in long um, and what I found is that what I, I've broken it up a little bit shorter in shorter segments so I'll actually say on this particular day and I have to do it for myself I'll have to restrict myself I'm only going to talk about this right and then we're going to build upon that the next day so do you do multiple lessons or Improvising will kill you every single time. So you just have to like stick to the point, stay out of the weeds, just leave it. And then I usually, for my stuff, I'll make a note that like I'll say, I don't know if they got this concept. And then when I see them the next time, I'll, I'll start off with, do you have any questions? But then I'll be like, how did this work out for you? And if they go, oh, I didn't, I don't remember that, then I know that they missed it. So breaking it up into smaller for sure, if you're seeing them multiple times is, is usually what I would recommend. And just, it's more for you. You have to just stick to what it is that you want to say because we want to explain all of it, right? We want to be like, because this relates to this and then this relates to this and then this relates, and we want to explain it all. Um, and again, some of it's so that they think that we're smart, right? So that they know that we're trying to prove that we're a professional, we know what we're talking about. But if they're already your client, they already trust you. They already know and trust you. So we don't have to jazz hands them with all of the extra stuff. We just have to give them what they need and stay out of the weeds. Does that make sense? Because you're kind of glazed over. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris. Um, and just listening to your um, points and points and points, I realized how many times I say to my clients, okay, so make sure. Make sure. <laughs> I'm just reviewing like, how I talk to my clients, and I do that a ton, which there are certain times where Make sure that your hands on the leash like this, or this, yes. this, it's just gonna go wrong and it's gonna be bad. So I know there's a tone involved when that lady says, okay, make, make sure, sure they go there and it's different. Um, is there other things, you know, what's your favorite phrases to use where you really have to communicate to the client, you have to do this besides make sure? Is there other phrases like be sure? You can certainly say make sure <laughs> when that is, like when it's dire. Right? If it, if it fits, you know, you want to make, you want to make sure that you say, make sure. Um, but the problem is, is we tend to say it for every little thing, like make sure you do this, make sure you do that. It's kind of condescending a little bit, right? Cause I say that to my kids all the time. If I think about it, right? Make sure you close the door, make sure you brush your teeth, make sure you, uh, right? So I don't want to have that relationship with them. So you can play around with it a little bit, but if you know that it's a situation where make sure you have the leash connected properly and the carabiner on because if this dog gets off, stuff's gonna go down. I would definitely use it because that's gonna stand out. But if you say make sure for everything, then when it's important, it won't, it won't, they won't register it. Does that make sense? Yes. Who's well, he next? popped out of nowhere. What were you doing down there? <laughs> Who's next? Anybody else? Um, so on the point of does that make sense, we actually had a client recently sort of complain about that. And so we've been actually making a point to say, do you have any questions as yeah. opposed to does that make sense? Because that can also be condescending. Like, does that does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Sort of thing. yeah, that's something I've recently been every time I say it, I catch myself and say, I'm sorry, do you have questions? We all have phrases that we say all the time that you can pick up on for sure. And I, uh, I make a joke uh, at the Trainers Unite Summit because one of the presenters there says fundamentally all the time or vast majority all the time. 
So we have what we call the filler words or repetitive words that we say all the time in Toastmasters, which are usually your ums, your ahs, your so's. And for this particular um, part of the workshop, I call it the ums, the ahs, the so's, and the fundamentalies, because there are words that you will say all the time. And once you catch it, uh, those are the ones that you're gonna focus on making sure, and the phrases that we say all the time, absolutely. So making sure that you're figuring out what it is that you're repeating is important. Who's next? John, not me. I'm gonna go up front. Okay. person or a phone conversation I just log in the time to hear people and I know that it's going to have stories of whole life stories of everything that they want to tell me which is why to be perfectly honest with you I stopped doing free assessments <laughs> because my time is valuable but if they're paying me for that time th that first assessment is almost like you're the psychiatrist and you need they need to just verbally diarrhea on you <laughs> to get it all out and I will let them do that uh, because they're gonna just keep interrupting you because they feel like you need to know this information so I categorize that session and part of my know your audience this is my way to really get to know your audience and I literally write a lot of their stuff down and I will, throughout my course of teach talking to them, I'll bring up that stuff. I'll say, how is it now when your son comes home from school? Because you said the dog really gets amped up and whatnot. And they literally are like, oh, you were listening. Lots of times that first session, they really just need someone to listen to. So I let them get it all out. Then after that, after that first assessment, when I'll say, because this is just my you can trust me, I'm gonna to listen to you, I'm gonna find out all your information, and now I'm gonna do a little bit of sales stuff, I need to show you that I know what I'm talking about, although most of us by now have websites and videos that have already done that, so a lot of people are already sign up for you and get there. But when I get to that part there, I'll just do that small section of, I just need you to know that I know what I'm doing, and they go, you get me. That's all they need to know in that time, right? That saying of people don't know or don't care how much you know until they know that you care is 100% true, right? And we really as dog trainers struggle with that because what happens when they come in is the, the owners come in with their dog and we're already going, I already see that you're holding the leash wrong, you're doing this wrong, you let the dog come in first, blah, 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 blah. You're, you're not listening to them at all because you're already mentally training their dog. Right? You're solving all their problems, you're mentally training their dog, and then you're not listening to them. And you wanna just, you know, we listen to respond. We're not listening to actually hear people. So if you devote that first assessment to really just, I'm not gonna train your dog, I'm not gonna already judge, I'm not gonna already figure out all the problems, because <laughs> we know the dogs, right? But that's not gonna be your goal in the communication because you're not gonna communicate to the dog. You're gonna communicate to that human. So you need to take that first time. Let them get it all out. Let them talk all of that stuff out. Take that all in. And then go show them one little thing. They're gonna go, they heard me. She understands me. She's gonna listen to me. And then when they come back the next time, you get a completely different person. They're now open. They're ready to learn. They're ready to listen. They're not gonna interrupt you as much. That's how I've done it, that's how I've sort of changed it. As I say, I had to change from my free assessment because I would go for my 45 minute free assessment and it would literally just be me sitting there going, oh my God. <laughs> so you got a puppy when you were three, wow. <laughs> and that was started your love of dogs, fantastic. You know, and you're never gonna get out. So I have literally written that off as this is how I'm going to start this relationship because that's really what it is, right? And again, we struggle with that. 
we don't listen to hear people. We really just listen to respond. We're, we're, we want to make sure that we get that response out. They say one word and our mind already starts formulating that response and we miss the rest of it and then they don't feel heard. So that's how I handle it. If I do have somebody in class that interrupts me in a class setting, again, I use comedy. <laughs> so I very much will call people out on it um, because they're used to me being funny, they don't generally get offended by it. Karen and I have spoken about this, because Karen and I, Karen Laws and I have done seminars together, and we've talked about the difference between the two of us, because I can get away with saying a lot of things that she cannot. <laughs> because if Karen says something, she, she, if she's trying to be funny, she's like, people will be like, what a bitch. <laughs> you know? I'll see the exact same thing, and people are like, oh my god, Tracy, it's hilarious, I love her. And I'm just like, yeah. You know, that's why it works, right? So you got to stick with your strengths. Karen can't get away with that. She, but, she, but at the same time, if we need somebody to come in and, and give a hard point, it's not gonna, then people will think I'm joking. People think I'm too funny, right? So we send Karen in. Karen, go handle that. And she does. <laughs> really works well. Our relationship works well, Karen and I, right? We have time for one more quick question. Okay. Okay, you're a great speaker and uh, much about dog training. I do have to ask, because you mentioned hecklers. Yes. <laughs> so, how many times do you get heckled, and what's a good heckler story how you came out of that? I actually don't get heckled that much. Um, I usually start off by saying that I'm incredibly sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> And that people are supposed to take it easy on me. And so far, that has worked. <laughs> I, um, I'm a suck. Yeah. So I come right out and I'm like, just whatever you do, don't do that. Because they'll take it really personally. And people are like, oh, she's very sensitive. Don't bother her. And that's worked really well. But I will say this. I've avoided, um, like, my Mo Monday stuff is done at nighttime in comedy clubs. And, uh, but all my other stuff, I tend to try to veer more towards daytime stuff because that's before people get drunk. <laughs> Usually, depending on where you are. Um, but I, I know for me personally, I actually have to get myself out of my comfort zone and start doing the nighttime stuff and actually just deal with it. But I've been avoiding it. So, flat out honesty. <laughs> well, everybody, before you give her the most raucous round of applause you can possibly muster. I just want to remind everybody that uh, Tracy's Tracy, an introvert. Tracy so. wants all of you to find her after this and ask her as many <laughs> questions as possible <laughs> and keep talking. And when she seems like she's done, that's just her cry to you to come closer. <laughs> so everybody, let's give Tracy a hand. Woo!